Now, to start our program, I'll turn it over to the Foundation's board chair-elect, who was also a chair of today's event, as well as a mother, a philanthropist, and attorney. She also has one of the most infectious laughs I've ever heard, and she also gives great hugs. It's my pleasure to introduce Andy Kramer. I would agree to get up here just so I could get a hug from Mary any day. So, hello everybody. Uh, I'm Andy Kramer, uh, board chair elect and co chair for today's luncheon. And I'm very, very glad to see so many friends of the CFW community here today. So, welcome. Uh, I've been a donor to CFW as well, and so I'm going to personally enjoy being your guide through the 25 years of the Foundation's history. So we're going to look at CFW in the world from 1985 to the present. We're going to make six stops on the way. And during each of those periods, our community faced difficulties, ambitious goals, and objectives that we needed to resolve. And we did accomplish remarkable things. So let's start at the beginning. In the year 1985, Ronald Reagan was sworn in for a second term. It was also the first time that we could buy CDs for music, including We Are the World by USA for Africa and Girls Just Wanna Have Fun by Cindy Lauper. It cost us $2.75 to see movies like The Color Purple and Back to the Future, and it cost $1.09 for a gallon of gasoline. Think about that. The FDA approved the first blood test for AIDS. Microsoft released Windows 1.0. <laughs> the first generation cell phone and cell network was up and running. Do you remember those? The phones looked like a brick and it had a huge antenna on it. You had to carry it in a backpack, okay? We had one woman on the Supreme Court and 25 women in Congress, including our first woman senator, and Emily's List was founded. Now here in Chicago, Harold Washington was our mayor, Oprah Winfrey was getting ready to launch her talk show, and the Chicago Bears won the Super Bowl. Hard to imagine. And the Chicago Foundation for Women was officially incorporated, making us one of the first 20 women's funds nationwide. Now our four founders' dreams, meaning four founders, uh, were almost, their dreams were almost as big as their hair. <laughs> At our first board of directors, there were 20, led by Iris Krieg, got right to work raising money. And our board included Marcy Love and Edna Shade, who are here today, as well as the late Eleanor Peterson. The CFW buzz started, so in the spring of 1986, we made our first grants, 25 awards totaling $50,000. And one recipient was Rape Victim Advocates. Hello, I'm Sharmili Majmadar, the Executive Director of Rape Victim Advocates. In 1985, if a woman walked into an emergency room saying that she had been raped by her boyfriend, it wouldn't be unusual for her to sit alone in the waiting area for hours, only to hear, are you sure that's what happened? Maybe you're just mad at him. Or if she went to the police to report the crime, instead of listening to her story, they might very well have said, you're gonna to have to take a lie detector test because you don't seem like you've just been raped. The worst part of it was, none of it was illegal yet. In 1986, Rape Victim Advocates received one of Chicago Foundation for Women's inaugural grants. We had been volunteer run for a decade without any paid staff and the landscape was just starting to change. At the time, Rape crisis centers had very few resources other than dedicated activists. 
Therefore, that first grant from CFW was important for both practical and symbolic reasons. Practically, the grant helped RVA hire our first paid staff to work with survivors and begin making headway in the policy arena. Symbolically, it also gave us hope. A women's foundation would build a community of philanthropists who would fundamentally understand the importance of anti-violence work. When we talk to CFW about our mission, we don't have to start from square one. The women and men behind this foundation get it, and they are willing to back us as we move forward. For this reason, I'm proud to be a personal donor as well as work at a grantee organization. At RVA, we work to ensure that survivors of sexual assault are treated with dignity and compassion, and to effect changes in the way that the medical system, legal system, institutions, and society as a whole respond to survivors. Today, while we still depend on over 100 dedicated volunteers to further our mission, we also have a staff of 13 working out of three community offices, and we are on call 24 hours a day to provide crisis support to su survivors of sexual violence at 11 hospitals across Chicago, ensuring that they are not alone. The Foundation's continued support has also ensured that we are not alone. CFW has helped build and sustain a strong anti-violence advocacy community in the Chicago area, which includes donors as well as survivors, activists, faith leaders, and elected officials. And because of this community, change is possible. Over the past year, investigative reporting and research revealed that DNA evidence gathered from sexual assault victims in Illinois was being ignored. The rape kits, as they are known, were sitting untested in crime labs or collecting dust on police shelves. This was a gross miscarriage of justice and a fundamental betrayal of survivors' trust in the system. But it was not against the letter of the law. Now, that has changed. With leadership from across the Chicago community, this summer, Illinois became the first state in the country to pass a law requiring that all rape kits are tested. I know that part of the credit for this victory goes to Chicago Foundation for Women for investing in our mission and supporting our capacity to hope. I'm proud to be here to celebrate 25 years strong.